Happy Labor Day weekend to you. Hope you're doing well and enjoying the longer weekend that we have. Love the timing on that. Love that football season has kicked off, but yet we still have warm weather, at least for a bit. So great convergence on that. In terms of timing also, we're an interesting time in the rhythm of life of our country because... (laughs) It's election season. In fact, we're well into it, right? We're in the 11th hour on it. And um, when I think of what's coming up uh, for the election, uh, as you know, of course, four years ago we had an election. And I remember uh, reading from multiple news sources that um, uh, Google, the search engine, the company, the search engine, said that (laughs) liquor stores near me and fries near me, those searches in their search engine were at an all-time high on that night. There you go. The collective angst and tension of our country. Now, I don't advocate drunkenness to deal with elections. That's sin anyway, right? So I, I don't even advocate using alcohol or food to medicate our emotions, right? We take our emotions to Christ, to God. But that searching was descriptive of what people were experiencing in the culture and um, of that tension and angst. And now, well, here we are again. We go through that season uh, yet again, four years later. In fact, we're so close that not only are we only several weeks away right now from election night, but at least six states start their early voting this month. So this is very timely. Now, why do I bring this up? Because you're like, man, I was enjoying this Labor Day weekend. You had to bring that up. Okay. If you're a Christian believer, what do we do in this season with political realities, this big thing called government, and all the uncertainty that surrounds all of that, right? Um, And there are many things people do things even that Christians can do. One obvious thing, obviously, is is our vote, being being election season. Every vote counts. Um, And as a fellow citizen, as a brother in Christ, I I encourage you to vote. You do where your conscience and will leads you, but I encourage you to vote to let the Christian voice be heard in our nation. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for as much as that we would be shepherded together by God's word in that. Just for a moment, I would uh, uh, mention 1 Corinthians 10.31, which says this, So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That includes how we relate to the government, that includes the ballot box, so on and so forth. So for any given person or party that is running, what are their policies? What are they going to do? And then may we as believers vote for positions, platforms, policies that most align with biblical values, positions, morals, even if imperfectly. Because every person we are voting for in a ballot box is under sin, you know, has, is a sinner just like we are. Um, but there are other things that Christians can do as well, right? Voting is obvious. People might say, well, I can write my congressman or woman, or get politically involved, and so on and so forth. We could make a big list. But if there's something more, is there something more than all of that? Something even beyond voting or other politically influential activities? Is there something that we can even do before and during and even after the election? Is there something, right, that might even ease the tensions in our own hearts to the extent that we have any of those. What do the scriptures call us to do when it comes to things as big as government? Now, we could do a whole series on that, actually. And we, if we did, we could go to places like Romans 13 and revisit that. We covered Romans 13 in the epic series. You can read that. Or 1 Peter 2.17, among others. But for today, open your Bibles or Bible apps to... 1 Timothy 7. 1 Timothy 7. And what I'm going to do is just to kind of kick us off. I'm, we're only going to be, I'm sorry, did it say 1 Timothy 7? 1 Timothy, there is no 1 Timothy 7, by the way. First, <laughs> where's the Bible scholars correcting me? Come on. Anybody go to Awana? Okay, so 1 Timothy 2. 
I'm going to read the first seven verses. There we go. All right. First of all, then I urge, I'm sorry, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So in light of these verses, among other things, we know that we can go beyond things like voting to prayer. Uh, even more, it's more powerful than voting because we can look beyond the ballot box to the very throne of God. The question is, are we? I'm guessing you've heard this, these scriptures before. But like all scriptures, the question we ask is, am I? Am I doing this? What do I do with this verse? Am I doing anything with it right now in my life? And so today's big takeaway, among, among others, is that uh, we ought to pray to God for all people, including those in high positions for the sake of how we lead our lives as godly people. Right? Pray to God for all people, including those in high positions, for the sake of how we lead our, lead our lives as godly people. Now let's consider um, uh, three implications of these verses, and based on these verses. Well, and here's the first one. God is the one to whom we can appeal for people, including those in authority. Now that isn't terribly profound. That's something pretty obvious from the scriptures. But I want to unpack it a little bit because it's good to remember this. See, here's the reality. He is still in charge. Amen? Amen. He is now. He will be during the election and he will be after the election. Okay? And this is implicit in view of verses 1 and 2. It's not stated explicitly, but it's implied. Let me, let me read those first two verses again. Uh, it kind of forms the backdrop. It says, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. These verses assume that there is someone, and we know that someone with a capital S, who that is God, to whom we can and must pray. So if you follow the logic on that, if kings are to be prayed for, then there is someone higher than the king, or for us, a president, to whom we can and should appeal, right? See, all, above all human governments is God, who is above all. And I am betting, though I don't bet, that he is not fretting over who's going to win this election. All right? Now, it doesn't mean we can't be concerned. It doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean it's not highly important. But it does mean that you and I can have a certain level of peace and that our prayers can make a difference. Now, if you're wrestling with that a little bit, here's, here's perhaps why. Because you know what? Doing this kind of stuff takes something, doesn't it? It takes faith. Faith to believe that to be the case. And so here's an opportunity for us to live it out, to live out our faith. So no matter who ends up moving into the Oval Office, God is still on his throne. And he has no term limits. He's not up for election. God's rule is absolutely uncontestable. And the beautiful thing in a world of so many imperfect leaders, his rule is perfect and good. He's to be loved with our hearts, pleased with our godly lives, and can be looked to in our prayers. 
And the beautiful thing is, though you're in my senator and president may change, he doesn't. We learned that last week. Pastor Brad took us through part of Hebrews 13. He is still God. He rules over who rules. And here's the beautiful thing. He can direct them if he wants. And or motivation for us to pray. We know this in view of Proverbs 21.1. It says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Romans 13.1 tells us, uh, For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Uh, Jesus said within Matthew 28, verse 18, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Not some authority, all authority. Not authority over, let's say, just southeast Michigan. No. Look at the scope. In heaven and on earth. So I hope that these verses, for you and me, that they encourage us because they give new perspective to us. Perspective can sometimes make all the difference. But I also hope that they drive you and me, they drive us to prayer. Because we see, secondly, to pray for all people, including those in high positions. Notice again what verses 1 and 2 say. I'm I'm not going to read them again. We'll get them on the screen there. Uh, It's amazing to me, by the way, that in this letter to to Timothy by the Apostle Paul, inspired by God here in his word, uh, after addressing, uh, he's going to be addressing a lot about Christian living and church conduct. That's a big theme there in 1 Timothy. After addressing what he does in the opening chapter of chapter 1, he then, after that, uh, breaks out with these words, first of all, right? It's like the first thing on Paul's mind for Timothy and his church is this, right? This kind of prayer. Uh, That it seems to be his heart burden that they would live godly lives and prayerful lives. They go together. He wants Timothy and by application us to pray for all people, among other things. And and do not miss that Paul first writes to pray for all people, okay? And I've talked a lot about the government, but look what the context is. It's praying for all people. It's okay for you and I to bring our personal concerns, our personal needs, our personal requests, our personal praises to God. Do it. We should. Do it regularly. Do it daily. But for you and me, does your prayer list regularly only concern you, or does it lift up to God other people? And notice he says it in terms of the different ways we we can appeal to God for people, right? He says supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. So multiple kinds of prayers. Supplications is asking God for something, right? It's petitioning him. The the NIV, I think, uses the term uh, request. You can petition the government. That's a right. But how much better? You can petition God. We can do that. Offer up supplications. uh, Prayers is self-explanatory. Intercessions is pleading or asking on behalf of someone else. What a wonderful thing to do for someone. I'm so thankful this church is full of people who do that. How wonderful is it when somebody intercedes for you? And then thanksgivings. That's the heart which we can do. That's the parts of our prayer, right? Um, God wants us to go to him thankfully. He gives and he has given. And he does give. He will give. And so maybe thanking God for what he has done or will do in the lives of people or maybe thanking God for the people themselves. I, uh, there are many people in our church like this. Um, uh, and I remember in a previous church, a guy coming up to me and he had a little black book and he just said, hey, uh, Pastor, I want, you to, I want you to know that I pray for you and your family all the time. I was like, I'm really thankful for that. And then he showed me, he's got this book. He says, man, I pray. He says, uh, he showed me, he's got this book with all these lists of all these people that he regularly prays for. And, and, and there, there may be folks here in our church as well that you have a book like that. But I was just amazed, like, this, how cool is this? And I thought to myself, I'm so thankful that he prays for me regularly. And, and I thought, I wonder what my life might be differently if he hadn't been regularly interceding for me and my family. And I want to be that for people here in this church and for other believers. And, I, and, and I'm so thankful for people who do that. And I know we have people like that here. We can pray for those in need, right? Their needs, their concerns, their decisions, their challenges, many things in their lives. But we can pray for those also in need of salvation. 
want to encourage that. In fact, praying related to salvation might be an application possible that we could put in our lives in view of what's going on here, purely because of the context. Verses 3 and 4 says, This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. What's a Savior? Someone who saves. All about salvation. This is good and it pleases... It- This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So pray for those who need salvation. And the things that he's calling people to do here is in the context of God's desire that people would be saved. So pray for those, uh, for all people, pray for those in leadership, pray for those in positions of authority. The Bible now highlights these people. So of all of all people, it now calls out these kinds of people. Begs the question, why? Notice it says, for kings and all who are in high positions. So not just for the king, also for those in high positions, but not to forget the king or forget kings. Of course, in our case, president would be more closest equivalent. Out of all the kinds of peoples here, he highlights these people. Again, why? Well, it's apparently important to God that we pray for those who are in authority. Um, they need our prayers, and we need to pray, the, whether it's the president, the Congress, our Supreme Court, lesser courts, state and local government, could be school boards, school principals, so on and so forth. Uh, there's a wide range of people and various authorities we ought to pray for. Um, pray perhaps for wisdom and decisions, righteousness in, um, in policy. Pray for their salvation. Now, before I go further, somebody might say, well, well, wait a second, (laughs) time out. What if I didn't vote for that person? I don't like them very much. I don't agree with them, and so on and so forth. And I understand that, but I want to encourage us to not let, in our life, to not let your preferences and politics get in the way of living out your faith. It's for me and you. Don't let your preferences and politics for or against any person in authority diminish your prayers for that person in authority. Pray for those who are in high positions. In fact, if it's helpful for you on that, if scholars are right about when they think that Paul was writing, maybe here around the mid-60s AD or somewhere in there, um, it is quite possible and probable that the emperor was Nero. Okay? He was in charge. And he had a lot more absolute power than a president in our society or anything could ever, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, he is considered by many, some or many, to be one of the most evil rulers of all time in human history, right? Here's what kind of guy he is. Great guy. He murders his mother, murders his first wife. Uh, he's believed to have been implicated in the setting uh, on fire of part of Rome. And then he scapegoats the Christians as the ones to have done it. And after scapegoating Christians, after burning a part of Rome, he singles them out for brutal treatment, even torture and death. In fact, we know some of the things about this because the ancient Roman historian Tacitus records in his annals these words. He says, therefore, to stop the rumor, I'm presuming he's referring to the rumor about maybe Nero doing it, um, he, Nero, therefore, to stop the rumor, he, falsely charged with guilt and punished with the most fearful tortures the persons commonly called Christians. By the way, this is not an unusual event in the life of the Christ- history of, of, of Christians, right? Christians are often hated. They're often singled out. We have spiritual warfare. I just find it very interesting, to say the least, that it seems in the human history, Jews and Christians have been singled out, most of all, more than maybe perhaps any other people group for persecution. It goes on. It's not on your slide, but he goes on to say about these Christians, he says, who were hated for their enormities, Right? Our enormities being living out the Christian faith, right? Um, In their very deaths, they were made the subjects of sport, for they were covered with the hides of wild beasts and worried to death by dogs or nailed to crosses or set fire to, and when the day waned, burned to serve for the evening lights. So again, that's Tacitus and his annals as translated by the fellows up there, Bowen in the the book uh, Roman in the West by William Stearns Davis, and there's all sorts of other attribution there. That was who was in charge. And they didn't have a vote about it. But they do, and we do, always have prayer, don't we? 
We might say, well, my, will my prayers make a difference? Well, if it's speaking on prayer, because there's different interpretations. If the last part of James 4, 2 is speaking on that, it says, you do not have because you do not ask. I wonder how much we don't have as believers because we're not asking. We're not praying about it. Uh, you might say, well, prayer is work. Where am I getting the time to pray for the government with regularity and so on and so forth? It is work. It does take time. It does take energy. If you're like me, you need some motivation to work, right? I know the leaves don't rake themselves, but the only... Uh, but when there's enough of them, I might finally do them. Raking my own lawn, and if Michigan football's on, all bets are off, okay? So we need motivation sometimes. So why would we pray? For those in authority, well, one, we're called to pray in God's word, right? It's right here. And if that's not enough, notice it can affect our lives, secondly. It can affect our lives. Notice the last part of verse 2 says that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So now it gets personal, hits home, right? People in high places, here's perhaps one of the reasons why, right? People in high places are people of influence. As many have said, leadership is influence, right? Right? And so people of influence are people of impact. What specifically do they impact? Lives, including our lives. So they're worthy of praying for because these prayers might, can lead to tranquility of life as we pursue godliness of life. Regarding the first, it says peaceful and quiet life. If you want a peaceful life, have a prayer for life. There are no guarantees of the results, Right? All of our prayers are superintended by what is ultimately God's will, and we can always trust him with whatever the results of our prayers are. But, uh, so there's no guarantee about the kind of person, their level of competence, incompetence, sins or not, but it is a good thing for us indeed to do. And then there's godliness and dignity of life. It says godly and dignified in every way. Dignity is the quality or state of being worthy, honored, or esteemed, according to Merriam-Webster. Prayers elevated to God, even for elevated people, may elevate our lives. And it goes with the word godly. A godly person seeks to please God. They pursue holiness and righteousness, what is right in his sight, in a way that reflects him. Godliness is a chief concern in 1 Timothy. If you just casually read 1 Timothy, you're not even paying attention real well. You can't come away with, uh, 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 without seeing, wow, godliness seems to be like a big deal in this book, right? Uh, in fact, Ray Van Nesty, who's a scholar, he writes the, notes the ESV study Bible, he says, this sort of living commends the gospel. So no wonder, no wonder salvation of people is spoken here shortly, a theme that will recur throughout the letter. When we live godly lives, it commends the gospel, it adorns the gospel. And so the good news about Jesus Christ in light of his perfect sinless life, his, his death on the cross for us, his burial and resurrection from the dead, that all those who put their faith in him might have salvation. So godliness is a, is a big deal in this letter. Chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. Listen to this. I love these words. It says, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So pursuing godliness, even more important than physical training, training ourselves for godliness. So, Godliness is a big deal in this letter. It should be a big deal for us in our lives, and it's a big deal when it comes to others because they can observe it. They might see hypocrisy on one hand, or maybe they see godliness. Right? Maybe they see the latter. Maybe they see more and more of a life that seems supernatural to them in a natural world, a life that seems different to them compared to what they're living or they see in others. And so our prayers for people and our godly living go together. They matter. They, the prayers we offer can impact the life we lead. Another reason for why we should do this is, is quite simple. It is good, right? Verse 3 says it pretty simply. <laughs> it says, uh, uh, this is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. And that last part leads into the fourth reason. It is pleasing in the, in the sight of God our Savior, right? A godly life seeks to please God and does, and prayer for all people, including those in high positions, pleases God. So if it is your aim, as it should be as a Christian with me, to please God, hey, this is teed up right for us. Then God wants all people to be saved. That's the fifth one. Um, We see this in view of verses 3 and 4. I just read 3. Verse 4 says, 
um, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So this is in the context of God's heart for the salvation of all people. There are many people, non-Christians, who are under the false presumption that God is only angry all the time, only wanting to constantly zap people, can't wait for it. He's only about his wrath, which is a caricature of the God who is. And to be sure, judgment is coming with certainty. And his wrath is real. And his wrath is good because he would not be a good God if he didn't do something about evil. In fact, he went so far to do something about evil that there's evil in us, we call it sin, that we had to have Jesus come for us. So God is really into doing things about evil, even the evil within us. And so his wrath is a good, it's just, it's perfect, but he's also loving and merciful and gracious. 1 John 4 says, God is love. And so you see central to him, his heart here, his, his heart for people. He's called God our Savior. So this reminds us of who he is even for us as Christians, first and foremost, Savior, if and only if you have put your faith in Jesus. He has saved you. And he wants to save others. And this should motivate us toward the prayers here and how we live our lives. Because again, godly lives adorn gospel witness. And so in light of verse 4, we see what he wants. He wants people to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is that? Well, most likely the truth is about Jesus, about the gospel, the good news about Jesus. In the light of the bad news about our sinful condition. By the way, this, this verse doesn't teach universalism, right? A false theology that everybody will be saved. Notice what it actually says. It says, who, desire, who desires all people to be saved. This is speaking of God's desire, his heart toward people, right? It doesn't say that all will be saved, just that he wants all people to be saved. He desires all people to be saved. We always need to remember that Scripture interprets Scripture, right? One Scripture brings light onto another. Uh, We know that not everyone will necessarily um, uh, not be under God's wrath because just a few pages earlier in my own Bible here, in 2 Corinthians 1, 7 through 9, we have these sobering words. It says, And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And it goes on from there. So some sobering things about the reality in light of the fact that Jesus came. He came to save and he's coming again. So though God prefers all to be saved, what prevails in his will is not everybody will be. Not everybody. You have the unrepentant, the recalcitrant, those who will never come to faith in Jesus. And maybe God is preserving the free will of people. Maybe it says, one scholar points out in light of Romans 9, to display the full range of his glory. I can't claim to plumb all the heart of God in that, but we see that God's heart is that he wants people to be saved. Why do I bring that up? Because the question is, do you? Do I? Is in the rhythm of our life, there's some sort of heartbeat in us that says about those people, whoever those people are for you, I can't wait for them to get their comeuppance. Right? Is that the default condition of our heart? And it's okay to want justice in this world. Don't get me wrong. But we're also to love people, even love our enemies. Is our heartbeat on the same page with God, his heart, and his mission. So you have to wonder why, after a call to these kinds of prayers, does Paul tell us now of God's evangelistic heart? It all hangs together. That perhaps what we're called to in verses 1 and 2, how we pray, how we live, is perhaps at least in part for the purpose and in the context of the salvation of other people. And so our lives can complement the gospel or not. If this is the case, these these themes start to weave together. And so he hones in now on salvation in light of the call to pray for all people, including those in authority. And so 1 Timothy reminds us that salvation is not only desired by God, but thirdly, salvation, redemption, is only possible through God. Mediation between God and man leading to these kinds of things like salvation, redemption, is only possible through Jesus Christ. We need to remember that. Because notice what it says further. 
The last three verses of our time together this morning says in verses 5 to 7, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Jesus is the only way to God, to salvation, the only mediator, or that is to say, go between, between God and man. I have a, a, a diagram, a, a crude one that I attempted to put together with uh, Melissa Mulvaney's help. It's an a adaptation of, of, of something you've probably seen that originated with the navigators, I think. Um, and so you see Jesus effectively Visually, if we were to pick this visually, between sinful man and, and a holy God. And he's the only one that fits. He's the only one that is a bridge. He's the only one that can bring reconciliation between God and man. Paul himself here was appointed to declare that Jesus did what? He gave himself as a ransom for all. That testimony needs to go out to people. Even the Gentiles, even though Paul is a Jew. The gospel needs to go out. Jesus was the ransom. He was the payment for, uh, or, or purchase for sinners. He died in our place. He paid the price for our sins that we could be redeemed so that we could be bought back. And we so easily think about that in the Christian life. I don't have time to unpack it, but think of what he did in the sense of only he could do it. Paying on the cross the cumulative horrors of all his people's sins there, including, your, including yours and mine. I don't think the physical aspect of it was, was the, imagine the lost forsake, lost felt, the felt lostness of the forsakenness of the Father. Experiencing actual condemnation in all of its unmitigated force on himself, absorbing it for you and everything you've ever done or will do, you and me both, in thought, word, and deed. There's only one being who can do that. He's the only way. We are saved by God alone. I'm, it says God our Savior. It doesn't see Kevin Meek. Kevin Meek's a Savior. And it's through Jesus alone, not by our religious or moral works. People need to come ultimately to the knowledge of the truth as those verses acknowledge. And so no wonder, verses 5 and part of 6 says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. And it goes on from there. There really is only one God. Not many gods like Hinduism and other religions teach. Though he exists in three persons, there is one God. And, importantly, there's only one mediator between God and men. Again, a mediator is a go-between, a bridge, if you will. And Jesus is that only mediator that brings sinful man and holy God together because Jesus... I mean, think about it. Jesus is a man. He is both God and man, 100% both. So as a man, he could be our substitute. But as God, he was a sinless substitute. Otherwise, he's just dying for his own sins, not yours. And only he has this power to, to collect, to absorb all of our collective sin in that moment, on that cross, and then given who he is, to then rise again from the dead and defeat sin and death. There has to be a God-man, and only God could think it up, and only God can make it happen. That is why we're not saved through other kinds of religious works. John 14, 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is good for us to be reminded of, this idea that there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, uh, because... Um, Words like we see up top there can seem awfully exclusive, too exclusive to some in our society today who think that uh, there may be many ways, many religions leading to God, many ways to God. But the reality is the scripture says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all and so on. And if it's helpful for people if you wonder, well, why, why is there has to be only one way? Let me use an analogy. A friend of mine, Scott Chapman, shared this analogy, and I'll share it briefly. Um, imagine there's a massive burning house. The thing is burning. It's about to come down. There's a bunch of people still in. They can't find their way out. 
Firefighters concernedly gather outside of it, and one brave firefighter, even though he knows the collapse is imminent, knows people are inside, and he goes in to save people. Now, normally this house has four exits and entrances, right? But three of them are blocked off by debris and smoke and fire. They're impassable. It only leads to death. There's one and only one exit. You know where this is going. The firefighter goes in there and urgently tells the people, you've got to get out, you've got to get out now. How silly would it be if those people then were to say, well, wait, but wait a second, we saw people go down that way. Yeah, but, but you know, that leads to death. You don't want to go down that way. There's only one way out. Whoa, 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 wait a second, time out. You're trying to tell me there's only one way out of here? That sounds awfully exclusive and unloving. What about all the people who chose the other way? No, the only logical thing to do is to know that there's one way and take it in light of a firefighter who courageously, sacrificially goes in and tells people what? The truth. And so we are in a similar situation. There's only one way, it's Jesus. And praise God, there's even one way. That God gives us the one way that we don't deserve. The way the mediator is exclusive, one mediator, but the invitation is gloriously inclusive. Not everyone will come, but anyone can come. Isn't that awesome? God, quote, desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Have you come to Jesus? Have you put your faith in him, trusting in him alone for his finished work for you and his death for you on the cross, his burial, his resurrection? Leaning on him alone for your salvation. Have you done that? Do so before it's too late. And if you have done that, and I'm guessing the vast majority of us probably have, only God knows, even in this really politically charged season, with peace in our hearts, knowing the one who really is ultimately in charge and will be after this election, let's pursue godly lives and elevated prayers. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, none of this that we have talked about is possible without you. How can we possibly pursue and even achieve godly lives without the God who enables it? We offer up prayers totally dependent on you hearing and answering and according with your perfect will. And Lord, you alone save. If we put our faith and trust, we're recipients of that. Help us to live lives so and offer prayers that comport with that, that for the sake of other people, knowing that you have a desire to save. You still do. And Lord, even in this politically charged environment, we be people who reflect Christ, who live godly lives, who offer up prayers to your throne diligently and fervently, who love people, care for people, serve people, reach people, and pray for people. And so, Lord, we're going to depend, as we always do, on your Holy Spirit to do that work in our hearts and our lives. That's our prayer uh, this morning in Jesus' holy name. Amen.